Hello everyone, I'm Geek Freak, and welcome to the video. To my fellow Yu-Gi-Oh fans, I have something to ask you. What is your favourite card mechanic in the game? And when I mean mechanic, I'm talking about something like gaining life points, or banishing your cards, or if you're into spirit monsters, I guess spirit monsters that return to your hand, or maybe equip spells. There are loads and loads of card mechanics in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. My personal favourite is banishing cards, either from your opponents or your own cards. I mean, banishing cards is hard to get back unless you have the right cards to actually bring them back. Gotta love banished cards. But in today's video, I'm going to talk about card mechanics that's been left behind in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! And I believe that these card mechanics should be given another chance. Now listen, I know there's quite a few that I know that I haven't put onto this list. And some of you are probably thinking, oh, but where's this card mechanic? Or, oh, where's this card mechanic? Well, it's either because I forgot about them or I wasn't interested in them. Or I thought, oh, they're just okay. They're not going anywhere for a while. You know, that sort of stuff. And these are the card mechanics that matter to me. And if there is a card mechanic that you guys like and I forgot about, and you want to see more of, I might make a second video. And that is a very big might. That's if, if this video does well. And please tell me what you guys' favourite card mechanic is. And in this video, I'm going to be giving my reasons as to why they should come back and how they could improve the card mechanics within the game. Well, most of them, but some of them I think would be a little bit too difficult to fix, but hey, I could be wrong. If I ever bring up a card mechanic in this list and I can't think of a suggestion on how they could fix it, or if there's a better way of fixing it, please let me know in the comment sections below. And some of you may think that some of these card mechanics are pointless and they are not needed in the game anymore, but again, I do believe that some card mechanics should be given another chance. I mean, what would you rather have? Would you rather have the old card mechanics or Pendulum and Link monsters? I mean, some people will say, oh, they like the pendulums or the links, but come on, pendulum cards are completely and 100% confusing. But anyway, yeah, I'm going off track. And so, this is the top 10 card mechanics in Yu-Gi-Oh that should come back or give them more relevancy. And so, as I said, let's move on to number 10. Now, in number 10, I'm going to do a rehash from a previous video I made. For my video, the top five cards that should be updated. Both number 10 and number nine is going to be from different videos but I just want to put them in this video because I think number 10 and number 9 has some great card mechanics. So again, number 9 and number 10 is from a previous video I made. And really, those segments should have been in a video like this one because of their card mechanics. So I just want to let you guys know that. And so, let's go. The Legendary Dragons, the Eye of Tomias, the Fang of Critias, and the Claw of Ermos. That's right, I am putting these three cards in this list. Now, I know what some people are going to say. They're going to say, Oh, but Geek Freak, most if not all the cards that we saw in the show with these cards have already been made. Maybe one or two of them haven't been released. Are you talking about those cards that haven't been released with these cards? Wait, 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 let me explain. Listen, I know for a fact the majority of the cards that's related to these dragons are and have been released, officially, more or less. But I think one or two might not have been released, you know, officially, and it's only anime only. I don't know which ones that are still anime only, but that's not what I'm talking about. The thing is, like Time Wizard, it was a missed opportunity to not use Time Wizard for more cards to evolve, like Baby Dragon into Thousand Dragon, Dark Magician into Dark Sage. They could have used Time Wizard for other cards as well, like maybe turning the Summon Skull into the Great Summon Skull or something. You know, something like that. The Eye of Tomias, Fang of Critias and the Claw of Ermos. Oh yeah, also, sorry for buttering the names. These three cards could have been used on other cards, like the Eye of Tomas has been used on the Dark Magician Girl and Dark Magician himself. The Fang of Critias has been used on Mirror Force and the Virus card. The Claw of Ermos has been used on the Red Eyes and a few other cards like the, the Time Wizard and a fair few others I've forgotten about. And you wanna know something? Like Time Wizard, these cards were a missed opportunity. And yes, listen, I know they're not canon, and they're anime only, and they don't play a major importance to the story, but my god, these cards were freaking awesome. You can turn any card into any equipped spell or a monster, 
and it would give those monsters special abilities or turn them into equip spells or turn them into kind of sort of trap monsters or something and for the ones we've got they're all good but I would have loved to have some more cards being used by these cards I mean what would happen if these cards actually fused with the god cards or what if the Fang of Critias actually fused with the blue eyes or what if the Claw of Ermos was used on Gearfried the Lightning or what if the Fang of Critias was used on the Dark Magician or Dark Magician Girl I honestly wish that we got to see more cards used with these cards now, I know what some people are going to say. They're going to say, Oh, but Geek Freak, there are way too many traps and monsters and spell cards out there. How are we going to choose which ones to fuse with these three legendary dragons? Well, when it comes to the legendary dragons, I don't think Critias, Tamias, and Hermos should just fuse with any card. But what if, now hear me out, what if these three dragons can only be fused with monsters, traps, and spell cards? that Kaiba, Joey, and Yugi has used throughout the entire series. Because, if I remember correctly, when the dragons turned to knights, I think they actually looked like Kaiba, Joey, and Yugi. And Joey, Kaiba, and Yugi were the chosen ones to wield these legendary dragons. So I think the best idea is, all the cards that Joey, Kaiba, and Yugi has ever had in their decks, spell, trap, and of course, monster, from Duelist Kingdom, Battle City, the semi-finals, the virtual world, the semi-finals, and from the movie The Pyramid of Light, and of course the Urukako Saga, where these dragons are united, and there's also the Grand Championships, and so on and so on. And there was also the Beyond Dimensions movie, so you know, from the beginning of the series all the way to the end of the original series, including the movies. And also, not just that, Yugi's deck was actually shown within GX, and there was a few cards in there too that we never actually saw within the OG series. And then there was Jaden's duel with Yugi near the end. And no, I'm not counting Kyber Man or the Red Eyes deck. Because those characters aren't Kyber or Joey. Unless they were actually in the other series or their decks was in another series. And it was said, oh, this is Kyber's deck. Or, oh, this is Joey's deck. Or, oh, this is Yugi's deck. Like in those two episodes, King of the Copycats. So you guys have basically got the general idea of what I'm trying to say. Every card that Joey, Kyber and Yugi has ever had should be able to fuse with these legendary dragons. And also, these cards won't be just strictly to their owner's deck, like Tomas for Yugi, or Critias for Kaiba, or Hermos for Joey. These three dragons can actually affect each other's decks as well. Do you guys remember Miraforce Dragon? It was a fusion between the Fang of Critias and Miraforce. And the thing is, Miraforce is actually Yugi's card, not Kaiba's. I mean, we've seen a fusion between Dark Magician Girl and Tomias, and we've seen Dark Magician with Tomias. But just imagine what the Fang of Critias and the Claw of Urmos could do to Dark Magician Girl and Dark Magician. Or imagine what the Eye of Tomas could do to Joey's cards like the Time Wizard or Red Eyes Black Dragon. Or Hermos with Kyber's Blue Eyes White Dragon. And it wouldn't just be monsters, there's the spell cards and the trap cards that each character has. Like what if Urmos fused with Negate Attack that Kyber has? Or what if the Fang of Critias actually fused with Jinzo? Or, what if the Fang of Critias actually fused with Curse of Dragon? It's like, okay, let's just say for example you got yourself a Dark Magician. And we've seen what the Eye Tomas does to the Dark Magician. But, what if the Fang of Critias fused with the Dark Magician or Hermos? That would be three different forms of the Dark Magician using different dragons. And, they might actually have different effects. Or, they might have the same effect or have different purposes. Like, what if Hermos actually turned the Dark Magician into a spell card, or what if the Fang of Critias actually turns a Red Eyes into a trap monster, or if the Fang of Critias actually fused with Monster Reborn, there would be three versions of each of the cards that these dragons would fuse to, and that would be a lot of cards, considering I said all the cards that Yugi, Joey and Kaba has had from the beginning all the way to the end. I mean, what if the Eye of Tomas actually fused with one of Joey's Landstar cards, or what if the Claw of Urmos fused with Kaba's Negate Attack, or what about this? What about Exodia and the Eye or Fang of or Claw of Ermos? There is a lot, and I mean a lot of potential for these cards. But, just so that they can't fuse with every single card in the game, I think they can only fuse with the cards that Joey, Kaiba and Yugi has used throughout the entire series. You know, handpicked by them, because they were the chosen ones. And these dragons can affect each other's owner's decks. So it would keep the cards to a minimum, but they would have loads of potential. And that's what I'm talking about. These cards add loads of potential. And again, I'm not saying that, oh, I want every single card 
to fuse with these dragons, but only the cards that Yugi, Joey, and Kaiba has ever used in the series. And again, there's like three versions of every card that they've ever used, if they was to use the dragons. Again, for example, what if the Claw of Hermos, the Fang of Critias, and the Eye of Tomas actually fused with the Dark Magician? That's like three versions of the Dark Magician, and not just that, what about fused monsters that Kaiba, Joey, and Yugi has at? They could fuse with them too. Again, they could do so much more with these cards. So yeah, that's an idea. Again, these things are like the Time Wizard with Baby Dragon and Dark Sage, or Thousand Dragon, or the Dark Magician. There could have been other monsters that could have been brought out thanks to the Time Wizard. So yeah, I've gone on long enough for this. Time Wizard. Okay, it's not necessarily the effect of Time Wizard. I mean, you've got like a 50-50 chance with success or failure with this card. I mean, it's not a bad card. There's really nothing wrong with this card, but I think they missed a really good opportunity for this card. Now, in the show, we see Joey use this card on his Baby Dragon, and if it's a success, Baby Dragon fuses into Thousand Dragon, and we see this with the Dark Magician when Yugi and Joey was dueling. Instead of destroying Dark Magician, it actually, it actually turned into the Dark Sage. Now, I will say this, Dark Sage is a pointless card to have in your deck, and it's a 50-50 chance that you'll get out in real life. But when it comes to Thousand Dragon, you just use Polymerization with Time Wizard and Baby Dragon. And you know what? This was a wasted opportunity. Time Wizard could have been used for other cards, like other monsters. I mean, we've had Dark Magician and the Dark Sage, Baby Dragon with Thousand Dragon. But what about other cards? What if there was other cards that could transform other monsters into other monsters? I mean, when you look at the Toon cards that Pegasus was using, he transformed the Blue Eyes White Dragon into the Blue Eyes Toon Dragon, and the Summoned Skull, and there was also the Dark Magician Girl, and there was Gemini Elf. I mean, if you've guys seen all the Toon monsters that was brought out, you guys know what I'm talking about. There was the Dark Magician, there was Buster Blader, Red Eyes, Toon Cyber Dragon, Toon Goblin Attack Force, Manga Rearan, Toon Aging Gear Golem, Toon RP Lady. There are quite a few tunes that was either in the show or wasn't in the show. It's something like that. Why didn't we get any other monsters for Time Wizard? Like maybe a thousand years past and you could have the Great Summon Skull or a thousand years past and you've got yourself the Super Great Ancient Gear Golem. And of course, they would have to have good effects. And if you ask me, I think Dark Sage should have an update and it can only be summoned if you have Time Wizard on the field and it can only be summoned by a success. And it's the same with Baby Dragon and Thousand Dragon should have himself a effect too. Or here's another idea. What if Baby Dragon and Thousand Dragons add multiple forms like 2,000 Dragons, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Thousand Dragons, but they can only be special summoned with the effect of Time Wizard. I'll say it again, I just love the idea that thanks to the effect of Time Wizard, if you're successful, you get to bring out a much more powerful card. And when you are successful, not only that, you'll also destroy all your opponent's monsters, and he takes half of their attack as damage, and they're destroyed. And then you can get your Dark Sage and your Thousand Dragon to attack your opponent's life points directly. I think that would have been a much more better idea than just having Time Wizard and Baby Dragon just fuse by using polymerization. Like I said, I absolutely love the idea that more monsters can be brought out thanks to Time Wizard. Again, like Dark Sage and Thousand Dragons. I mean, hey, if we can have more tunes for the Toon monsters, then why can't we have more Time Wizard related monsters? Just like Dark Magician and Baby Dragon that turns into Dark Sage and Thousand Dragons. And you know what? I hope they do this in the future. I would like to see Thousand Dragons and Dark Sage updated with some good effects and again, more monsters, or there could be a an evolution after the Thousand Dragons. The Time Wizard could bring out bigger, better, awesome monsters. And also, he also clears your opponent's side of the field. And then you can just go onto the attack. For me, that is just absolutely awesome. I've always loved this idea for Time Wizard, and I hope they do this in the future. And with that said, let's move on to the final one. And number eight is the level monsters. Now, I know these things haven't been fully successful in the past because each turn, either at the end of your phase or you have to defeat a monster and then at the end of, your, at the end of your phase, you can level up your monster to whatever level monster that you've got, like Dark Mimic level one, and its next level is level three. I mean, there's loads of these things. You've got the Armed Dragons, Horus the Black Flame Dragon, Masked Knight, Silent Magician, 
Silent Swordsman, Mystic Swordsman, Aelor Queen, and Ultimate Insect. And there was the level monsters that Yugi used, called Silent Magician and Silent Swordsman, and there was Wing Karibo level 9 and level 10. Now my favourite level monsters is Wing Karibo level 10. This card can destroy all monsters on the field, well, all of your opponents out of the field, and you lose life points compared to the attack of the monsters. That'll help you out in a pinch. And then there was Yugi's cards, the Silent Swordsman and the Silent Magician. Now when it came to Yugi's cards, the Silent Swordsman and the Silent Magician, unlike other level monsters, every one of your standby phases, these two cards gains 500 attack points and its level increases by one. And even though this is the only thing that these two monsters can do, I wish there was more than they could do with that. But I'll get to that in a second. There was the Arm Dragon level 5 and 7 and 10. But level 10 is the best because you can discard one card to destroy all your opponent's monsters on his side of the field. Well, his face up ones. But level 5 is also great. So yeah, level 5 and level 10 is my favourite of Arm Dragon. Now, when it comes to Horus the Black Flame Dragon level 8, this card is also my favourite because basically this card can negate the activation of a spell card. He's basically Jinzo but with magic cards and Horus level 6 cannot be affected by magic cards. Now listen, I do love the level up cards. Well, the ones that I've mentioned. Arm Dragon has a good effect, Horus has a great effect and all the other level up monsters are great. But the problem is you have to wait every turn in order to level up your monster because Horus of Black Flame level 8 is basically Jinzo except for spells and Arm Dragon level 10 is basically a uh, Raigeki for face up monsters. But the thing is you want to have these cards on the field now but you have to wait one or two turns in order for you to have your most powerful level monster. I mean yeah you could tribute um, a monster for Arm Dragon level 5 so you really didn't need a level 3 unless you actually needed him because basically Arm Dragon level 3 really doesn't have anything going for him other than he's there to be tributed for level 5. But sometime later Arm Dragon got an upgrade and it was called Arm Dragon Thunder and it was given a much more better effect. And you know what? I get it. We all want to bring out a most powerful monster on the field and use its effect. But let's just say for example that you've only got an Arm Dragon level 3. You would have to wait 3 of your turns to bring out Armored Dragon level 10 unless you had a magic card that helped you special summon the next level up monster. I think they do but I just forgot. Yeah I do see the problem. And when it came to the Silent Swordsman and the Silent Magician that Yugi had when he used them against a Tem. And the thing is, I really do like these sort of cards. I mean, in my opinion, I think the level up cards should have been something like what Yugi used against a Tem. And I know that's all they do is just get 500 attack points each turn and they also level up one. I mean, that's all well and good, but let's just say for example that they did continue this sort of card trend. Instead of just get, gaining more life points, and leveling up. What if, after when they get to a, like a, a certain level, like, I don't know, like level 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, depending on the monster, after when it gets to a certain level, say for example, level 6, when this card destroys a monster, half the attack points of the destroyed monster gets inflicted to your opponent's life points. And when it gets to level 8, this card can destroy all your opponent's monsters side of the field. And when it gets to level 10, it destroys all your opponent's monsters on the field. And your opponent loses after equal the life points as to what your opponent's monsters was. You know, it would be something similar to Time Wizard. Or, here's another example. What if the Silent Magician's special ability was, at level 5, you can search out a card in your deck and add it to your hand. Or, when it gets to level 7, you can pick two magic cards from your deck. Or, if it gets to level 10, you can pick five magic cards from your deck while it's gaining attack points. I mean, each level monster would have its own unique ability every time it levels up. And you wouldn't need to, like, you know, special summon from your hand or your deck from your standby faces, like you do with Arm Dragon and Horus. I do like this version of leveling up, and it would depend on the monster that you have. Those are the sort of level up monsters that I do like. But the problem is, you don't want to want to wait until your monster gets all those attack points, all that level, and its special abilities especially on its final level. And special summoning Arm Dragon level 5, 7 and 10 or Horus or the Silent Swordsman, you, know, you, guys got, you guys know what I'm trying to say. So what could they do to make the level monsters more re relevant again? 
Well, I do have a few ideas, and my first idea is turn count cards. Now, there's only ever been one turn count card that was made official, and that was Pyro Clock of Destiny. In this card's effect was move the turn count forward by one turn. The turn in which this card is activated continues as normal. This is the only card, to my knowledge, that has officially been released, and it's a very unique ability. So, let's just say for example that you got Swords of Vivian Light, and your opponent has used it on you, and it's been two turns since then, but then you decide to activate Pyro Clock of Destiny, then that would mean you would have been on your third turn, and then Swords of Vivian Light would just disappear. And you know what, I really do like this sort of ability. And also, there was a, another card like Pyro Clock of Destiny, and it was in the show, and Yugi used it in his duel against Atem, and it was called Jump Turn. Basically what this card does, it's like Pyro Clock of Destiny, but in this case, it's three turns that have passed. And you know what, this is a cool card mechanic. I mean yes, I know I'm going off topic, but there are a few cards that you can use with this. Again, like the level up cards, three turns go by, and then you can special summon the highest level of the level monster that you're using in one turn. Or the same with Yugi's level cards. Three turns go by and your Silent Swordsman and Silent Magician has 25,000 attack points. Or you could use it on different dimension capsule or golden sarcophagus. You know those cards that you banish those cards into your second standby face. Screw that, with this card you can get in one turn. Or your opponent has a Swords of Revealing Light on you. No problem, boom, jump turn can fix that. You know what, to be fair, I really should have put a segment for a card mechanic like this, where it forwards the turns. So anyways, yeah, I'm going off track. They could do that, use cards that forwards the turns by three or two or one. Or number two, let me ask you guys something. Do you guys remember the card Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth? You had to wait six turns in order to get Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth out in the field. I mean, Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth had a good attack to it, but it's really nothing you can write home about, especially these days. If you guys know what the Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth is, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Now the thing is, you are to tribute one petting moth and special summon Cocoon of Evolution. And Cocoon of Evolution had to stay on the field for six turns before you can bring out the Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth. But I highly doubt anybody would want to put Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth in their deck because your opponent will destroy Cocoon of Evolution before your next turn. But now, there's a Cocoon of Ultra Evolution. And basically, this card lets you tribute summon any insect that's equipped and special summon any insect from your deck. And that even means you can special summon Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth from your deck without going through that pain in the ass playing Cocoon of Evolution. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because they should make a card similar to Cocoon of Ultra Evolution where it brings out the highest level of level monster that you want, like Harm Dragon level 10 or Oris the Black Flame Dragon level 10. They could do something like that for the level monsters, where you can special summon the level monsters either from your hand or from your deck. And that's idea two. And idea three is make level monsters absolutely broken. Like make their highest levels have powerful offense or defense and have a powerful effect. Like maybe the highest level of this monster can be attributed and it deals 4,000 life points to your, well, life points. Well, not to your life points, but to your opponent's life points. Or you could have a level monster at its highest level as a powerful attack and its effect is you can draw five cards at your draw face instead of one, as long as this card's up on the field. So yeah, those are my suggestions for the level monsters. And I know this has been a very long segment, but you know what, I think the level monsters should be given another chance. And also, I think Yugi's level monsters should be released, and I think there should be more of them. You know, every turn, your monster gains 500 attack points, and when it gets to a certain level, you can activate its special ability. I really do like that version of leveling up. And so with that said, let's move on to number 7. And number seven is Union Monsters. Now, when it comes to Union Monsters, it's a little bit confusing. Well, not really, but each Union Monster has its own unique ability. But the best and well-known Union Monster is Dark Blade, with an attack of 1,800. And its Union Monster is Pitch Dark Dragon. 
Now, there's one thing that's always been bothering me when it came to the Union monsters. Well, basically, there are two monsters equipped with each other. If Pitch Dark Dragon is on the field, you can equip Dark Blade to Pitch Dark Dragon. And if you do this, you also gain a special ability. And like I said, the effect differs from each monster. And to be honest, I always saw the Union monsters as a kind of sort of fusion in a way. Because if you think about it, Dark Blade and Pitch Dark Dragon are equipped with each other. And also, funnily enough, Pitch Dark Dragon and Dark Blade actually has a fusion monster. And it's called Dark Blade the Dragon Knight. And to be honest, I found this really, really odd. I mean, you would have thought, since they're equipped with each other, you would have thought the union between Pitch Dark Dragon and Dark Blade would have the effect of its fusion counterpart. And if you really think about it, this really shouldn't even be a fusion monster because Dark Blade and Pitch Dark Dragon hasn't fused into one being. They are two separate entities, and Dark Blade is actually riding Pitch Dark Dragon. So if you ask me, it doesn't really make sense for Dark Blade and Pitch Dark Dragon to be a fusion. And that's the thing that really gets me. I mean, let's have a look at Dragoon of Red Ice. Now, this, this is a fusion monster. It's a fusion between a Dark Magician and a Red Ice Black Dragon. These two monsters have been fused into one entity. And you know what? That actually makes sense to use a polarization card because they are two beings fused into one. Now, let's have a look at Gaia the Fierce Knight and Cursor Dragon. And again, it also has a fusion monster and it's called Gaia the Dragon Champion. And again, this isn't just, you know, two beings mixed into one. It's two separate beings. They haven't fused into one monster. Gaia the Fierce Knight is actually riding on Cursor Dragon. And you know what? It makes perfect sense for these two, Cursor Dragon and Gaia the Fierce Knight, to be union monsters. Because again, they haven't fused into one being. They are two beings complementing each other, like Dark Blade, the Dragon Knight. And is another example of Union Monsters being turned into fusion monsters. Now, when it comes to X Head Cannon and Y Dragon Head and Z Metal Tank, these three are Union Monsters. These three work together. You can unionize X Head Cannon with Y Dragon Head or X Head Cannon with Z Metal Tank or Y Dragon Head with Z Metal Tank. And guess what? They have fusions with each of the link ups that I've just mentioned. Now the thing is, I kind of see why they had a fusion with the XYZ Dragon Cannon. I mean, I really do like that card, but you would have thought if the XZ Cannon and Y Dragon Head was to un unionize, they would have gotten the effect of their fusion instead of being a fusion monster. So yeah, those are my nitpicks for the union monsters. I think some fusions should be unions and some fusions that's supposed to be fusions so i'll just leave that for you guys to think about anyways i think the union monsters are a great idea if they're equipped with each other they have two attacks combined and they have a special ability if you unionize them i mean they would have separate abilities on their own but if they combined they get an even more powerful effect with even more attack points and you know what that's a great idea i always had this idea that you can attack twice with union monsters because you know there are two monsters and if your opponent tries to destroy your monster on the field with the Union monster that's equipped to it, then the equipped Union monster would be destroyed instead. So at the very least, you'd have a meat shield protecting you. The thing is, when it comes to Union monsters, it's a little bit tricky because, like I said, each Union monster would have its own unique ability. But here's what I would do. Number one, if a Union monster is about to be destroyed by battle or effect or something, then the equipped Union monster will be destroyed instead. Number two, both of their attacks combined. Number three, they can attack twice because they're technically two monsters. And number four, alongside their ability, when they combine, they can also use their own abilities as if they were apart. So you'll have three effects. That'll be cool. But I think the main problem with unions is that you have to get them out from your deck in order to actually use them. I think that was one of the reasons why the unions weren't that good. That you have to get them out of your deck first to your hand and then you can use them. But saying that, I really do think they should give the Union Monsters another chance. Like, why not have a few cards that let you put a couple of Union Monsters from your deck to your hand, or special summon them from your deck to your to the field. The Union Monsters does have a lot of potential, and I do see the problems with them, but if there's any other problem that the Union Monsters have, please let me know in the comments section below, because I haven't seen all of them. So yeah, this will give you guys something to think about. And also, just like my last segment, why not make Union Monsters have powerful effects, especially when they're unionized. 
that's also another way you can get people to use them again. And so with that said, let's move on to the next one. And I love this next one, and the next one is Equip Spell Cards. I mean, Equip Spell Cards, when I started playing Yu-Gi-Oh! was one of my favourite cards to play in my deck. And over the years, I could see why people weren't playing them anymore. I mean, seriously, there is magic cards or spell cards out there, specifically equipped spell cards, that only gives you a 200 to 300 attack points or defence, like the Legendary Sword, Dragon Treasure, the Book of Secret Arts, Ray's Body Heat, Mystical Moon, and so on and so on and so on. And these sort of cards would only work on specific monsters like Book of Secret Arts on Spellcasters, Raising Body Heat on Dinosaurs, Dragon Treasure on Dragons, Legendary Sword on Warriors, Sword of Dark Destruction that only works on Dark Monsters. There was loads of cards like this, and it would only work on specific monsters, just like what I said. And just to let you guys know, there was also traps that also did this, but it wasn't a equipped spell card. But like the ones I just mentioned, they just gave you meagre small attack points. And as the series went on, the equipped spell cards started getting better and better, like Lightning Sword that gave you a 800 attack points for warrior types. And I think my favorite equip spell cards was um, United We Stand. There was Megamorph. There was Mage Power. There was Axe of Despair. Now the thing is, I didn't mind if equipped spell cards could only work on certain monsters or certain attribute monsters. You know, Swords on Warriors, Wands on Spellcasters, Salamandra on Fire Types. Because, you know, that does make sense. I mean, how weird would it be if there was a dinosaur who was holding the Lightning Blade Equip Spell card. And yes, I know we've got Guardian Grohl, that older axe, but I'm trying to make a point here. And there was also this card called German Infection, where the attack of non-machine top monsters equipped with this card is decreased by 300 points at each of its standby phases. I mean, that's pretty good. And the reason I like this is because it doesn't work on machine type monsters, because germs don't work on metal. And if you ask me, I think that's really, really clever. It emerges you into the game. Like, here's another example. Let's just say, for example, that there was a, a sword that was made out of water. It would increase the attack of a water-type monster, but it decreases fire monsters because fire is weak against water. You know, attributes weak against some other attributes, and some attributes can overcome others, you know, stuff like that. And I know there's lots of equipped spell cards out there that does all sorts of different things. And you know what? It's awesome when an equipped spell card can work on any monster, and I'm also okay when an equipped spell card can only be equipped to like um, a type of monster, like a dinosaur or a spellcaster or a warrior or something like that. Or it's only allowed to be equipped to a certain attribute monster, like it can only be equipped to dark monsters or light monsters or fire monsters or water monsters, you know, stuff like that. I don't really mind that. Equipped spells can make your monsters attack more powerful or it has some sort of special ability, like change your opponent's monster into defense, or it could be like a, a fair meteor crush. There are loads and loads of magic cards out there with different effects. And you know what? That's fine. But there's always been one type of equip spell, and that is equip spell cards that only equip to certain monsters. Like, for example, there are equip spell cards that only can be equipped to elemental heroes. And there's also the noble arms cards that goes along well with the noble knight cards, even though the cards said that it can be equipped to only warrior types. Now listen, I'm okay with equip spell cards being equipped to specific monsters, like Amplifier that can equip only to Jinzo. That is perfectly fine with me. And you know what, to be fair, it solely depends on the equip spell really, but just having loads of equip spell cards that can only be used for a certain group of monsters, like again, the Noble Knights and the Elemental Heroes. I think more than anything, I think I'm just ticked off that only certain equip spell cards can only be equipped to a certain group of monsters. I mean, I'm okay with that. But what I'm trying to say is, I wish we had more variety. You know, equip spells for dinosaurs, equip spell for water monsters, equip spell for fires, equip spell for spellcasters, or equip spell cards that you can put on any monster. For me, this is just conflicting. Like, I want more spell cards to be made, but I understand why people don't use them anymore. Well, it depends on the deck that you're using, but I miss the days when we used to bring out a warrior monster and then you would equip Lightning Blade to it, your warrior monster would get 800 attack points, and all water monsters on the field would lose 500 attack points. I mean, back in the day, this was awesome. And saying that, yeah, equip spell cards wouldn't last even a single turn in this day and age. 
because of special abilities or using a typhoon card or anything that destroys magical trap cards. So what can we do to make equip spell cards relevant again? Well, like my previous idea, make equip spell cards as broke as possible. Like for example, what if you had an equip spell card that was called the Trident and it only works on water monsters and your monster gains 3000 at top points and if your opponent's side of the field is full, destroy all your opponent's monsters on his side of the field. I mean, yeah, that's basically the only solution that I have for equip spell cards is just to make them as broke as possible. So people will say, oh, well, this equip spell card is so damn awesome. You know what? I'm going to put it in my deck. I mean, you can make the most weakest monster you have in your deck the most powerful with an, an equip spell card. Or here's another example. You could have an equip spell card called the Ancient Staff, where it gives your spellcasters 2,500 attack and it can destroy all your monsters on your opponent's side of the field. And if you do that, draw as many cards from your deck to your hand. You can only do this once each turn. And it wouldn't just be powering up your monsters and giving them special abilities. You could have only certain monsters can be equipped or affects certain monsters. Again, like German Infection, it cannot be equipped to machine type monsters because, I mean, obviously it's not gonna work on machines because they're not organic. Or here's another idea. What if you add equip spell cards that could actually summon monsters from your deck? You could activate an equip spell card for warriors and it can special summon any warrior from your deck and it gains 2000 attack points. And if the monster is about to be destroyed by effect, trap or spell card, send the equip spell card to the graveyard instead. And it doesn't have to be just for warriors. You could do it for dinosaurs or machines, sea serpents, etc, etc. Equip spell cards for summoning monsters to your side of the field. I mean, that's an interesting idea. Or here's another example. Let's just say, for example, that you had a, an equip spell card and it can only be attached to fire monsters, but it would be weak against water monsters. You guys know what I'm talking about. I guess that's my only solution. If you want to make forgotten cards or abandoned card ideas more relevant, make them broke. I guess this card mechanic hits home a little bit because it was just so cool that you could attach a equip spell to monsters and they would just get powerful from it. Or here's another idea. You can have an equip spell card, the mosquito, that's attached to a dinosaur monster. So if your opponent destroys the dinosaur that the mosquito is attached to, you can special summon back the dinosaur that was destroyed last turn. Because you know, hey, mosquito, Jurassic Park, you know, you guys get? I think it's my longing to use equip spells again. I just think they're a lot of fun. And the only way to make them more relevant again, if you just broke them, well, their abilities are broken anyways. So yeah, well said and done, let's move on to the next one. And the next one is attributes and type of monsters. I was going to make a separate one for each of these things, but more or less, the attributes and the type of monster are intertwined with each other. You know, like... Uh, fish is water, pyro monsters are fire, rock monsters are earth, and so on and so on. Now these days, I've noticed that cards are just usually centered around one sort of archetype. I mean, think about, it. there's the blue eyes white dragon, the dark magician, the red eyes, the elemental heroes, you know, stuff like that. I mean, I miss the days when a card said, this card can only work on spellcasters, or this trap can only work on water type monsters. I mean, okay, let me give you guys an example. Now, my favorite type of monster is dinosaurs. Those are my favorite type of monster. There was Black Tyranno, Frostosaurus, Ultimate Tyranno, Superconductor Tyranno, Dark Triceratops, and a fair few others that have pretty good effects. But when it comes to dinosaurs, there really isn't that many compared to other types of monsters. There are loads of dragons, there are loads of warriors, there are loads of spellcasters, etc, etc. Now, it isn't the number of Dinosaurs that are low that I'm complaining about even though that is true. No, no, I'm talking about something else Now if you were to have a look at the dinosaur monsters You have dinosaurs that fall under a specific name like the dino wrestlers the Jurassic dinosaurs the Evolusaur dinosaurs and obviously there's the dinosaurs that doesn't have a specific title now the thing is I don't understand why there needs to be a Jurassic or evolution or Dino Wrestler, and all those cards have support cards, or as monster effects that supports that specific sort of dinosaur. You know, the evolutions, the Jurassic, the Dino Wrestlers, you know, that sort of stuff. 
Now listen, I can understand if they were to do this with uh, dragons or spellcasters or warriors or whatever. Because they've got loads of spellcasters, warriors and dragons and so on. But saying that, I don't really like this. Because again, there is only so few dinosaurs in Yu-Gi-Oh! And now they've split them into three groups. Again, the Evolutions, the Jurassic and Dino Wrestler. And some of their effects are target one Jurassic Dinosaur. Search out a Dino Wrestler. You can special summon a Evolution Dinosaur Monster. And that's the thing I'm talking about. Why don't they just make just regular, normal spellcasters or warriors or dinosaurs? And don't have support cards, only support those sort of cards. You know, if they fall under the Jurassic title or the Dino Wrestler title. I mean, you could have more spell and traps and monster effects that could help you with your dinosaur deck. Or, is another example. Do you guys remember the Legendary Ocean? Now, this card was a blast. A Legendary Ocean gave 200 attack and defense points to all monsters that are water types. And it reduces the level of all monsters that are water in your hand and on the field by one. And you know what? Legendary Ocean is a big help to all your water monsters. And you know what? That's what I like. It might be helping a specific group of monsters, but it's working for all your water type monsters. I mean, Legendary Ocean isn't saying this card is only looking for specific water type monsters, but all water monsters in general. But you know what? If Legendary Ocean was to get a update, I think, in my opinion, I think another effect should be all fire monsters on the field loses 500 attack points because, you know, water beats fire. Now, the thing is, I don't mind if there are some cards that only works for certain cards. Like, for example, the Dot Magician Girl. With the Sage's Stone and Dot Magician Girl is on the field, you can special summon Dot Magician on the field. And you know what? Some of that is okay. Or, what about Burfamet and Gazelle, the King of Mythical Beasts? They can fuse into one monster, and if it's destroyed, you can special summon Burfamet in defense, and you can add one Gazelle, the King of Mythical Beasts, to your hand. And to be honest, I've never ever been a fan been a fan of support cards that there has been a whole bunch of cards that revolve around the blue eyes, the red eyes, etc, etc. I mean, let's have a look at King Dragoon for a second. It's a fusion between Lord of D and Divine Dragon Ragnarok. And its effect is your opponent cannot target dragon monsters with effect cards. And you can special summon one dragon monster from your hand. And that means any dragon. It isn't saying, oh, you can only summon only blue eyes or red eyes. It says any dragon monster. And I hope you guys know what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, the game needs to go back to the basics and start using the types and the attributes of monsters more. And not have them have cards that only works for specific spellcasters or warriors or dinosaurs or other. I mean, if a spell card was to say, oh, bring out any two dinosaur monsters from your deck, then you can pick any dinosaur monster from your deck. Or, if your dinosaur is facing off against a fire type monster, your dinosaur gains 200 attack points because dinosaurs love the heat. You know, one element weakens another element and another element makes another element stronger. You know, you guys get. And like I said, they need to go back to the basics and use the attributes of the monsters and the type of monsters and not use effects that only targets one specific type of spellcaster or dinosaur all over. Because I think these are the things that the game of Yu-Gi-Oh has left behind. So I hope you guys got what I'm trying to say. And so, with that said and done, let's move on to the next one. And the next one is going to be a short one, the old pick and choose. Now, what am I saying? What am I talking about? Now the thing is, I don't really think this type of car mechanic has been used that much. And to those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, well, do you guys remember a card called Magical Ats? I saw this card in Duelist Kingdom. When your opponent attacks your monster, take two non-monsters from your deck and then shuffle the three cards and set them on the field face down. And your opponent has to figure out which card is your monster. So at least it would give you time. Now the thing is, I really do like the anime version because there was actually four hats instead of three in the real world card. And, if I remember correctly, I think Yugi also placed a trap underneath one of the hats. 
So if your opponent picked the one that had the trap in it, and if your opponent picks the trap, and depending what it is, then you're screwed. I mean seriously, why couldn't we get a magical ats that had this sort of ability? Like, okay, let's just say for example, we added a updated magical ats, and it filled up all the monster spaces on the field. One of them was your monster, and the others could be traps. Like, maybe one of them is the mirror force, or maybe one of them is magic cylinder, or draining shield. I mean, you could call it um, magical trap hat or something. And here's another one, chosen one. If I remember correctly, I think this card was used in the duel where Kaiba and Yugi was facing off against Umbra and Loomis. So basically, your opponent chooses one out of three cards, and one of them is a monster. And if he picks the monster, you can special summon it to the field. I mean, yeah, it's not really a reliable card, but if this card was to be updated, maybe they could add something like, you can add a trap, a spell card, and a monster. You shuffle them, and put them face down, and your opponent picks one. Now, if it's a magic card, activate it right away. If it's a trap card, you can activate it right away. Or, if it's a monster card, you can special summon it to the field, ignoring its requirements. And also, there's other cards that does this. There's the Toon Dot Magician, where you pick three monsters, you place them face down, and your opponent chooses. And you can special summon that two monster to the field. And there was a spell card called Bingo Machine Go. And with this card, you can pick three cards that has the word Blue Eyes in it. You face them down, you shuffle them, and your opponent picks a card at random. And that random card is added to your hand. You see, this is a fun idea. And I'm surprised they haven't done loads of ideas for this. Or update cards, like the Magical Ats or the Chosen One. Like, instead of just having your monster on the field face down, you could also put them down for traps as well. And the same with the Chosen One. Like, for example, let's just say, for example, that they decided to do a card called the Super Chosen One. Instead of a 1 in 3 chance, why not have a card saying, pick one 4 level monster, pick one 6 level monster, or pick one level 8 monster from your deck. You put them face down, shuffle them, and your opponent has to choose one of them. And you can summon them face down or special summon them in a tap position. Or you could have a spell card that could let you choose three magic cards from your deck. You put them face down, you shuffle them, and your opponent has to choose one of them. And whatever magic card he chooses, you have to activate that card right away. But my favorite idea has to be the magical ats one. You fill out all your monster zones. One of them's your monster, and all the others are traps. And that, in my opinion, is fun. I'm surprised they haven't used this sort of card mechanic in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh more. Because hey, it is a fun way. It would be all based on luck, either adding it to your hand, or special summon it, or using the magical trap card. Again, you could just do so much with this sort of idea. This is a card mechanic that needs to be explored a little bit more. Especially if they're going to do an idea like the magical ats, except in this case, it's updated. Or you could call it magical trap hats. I just love the idea. And so that said, let's move on to the next one. Now, I've already talked about this with the level monsters, and that is the skip a turn cards. Now listen, I'm surprised that they didn't do more with this sort of card mechanic. And just to give you guys a little bit of a reminder of what I'm talking about, there was the Pyro Clock of Destiny, where it moves the turn forward, and there was Yugi's card, Jump Turn, where three turns have passed. So basically, let's just say for example, your opponent has the Swords of Revealing Light, and yes, I know you can destroy it with a monster effect, or a magic effect, or a trap effect. But just hear me out, I'm trying to make a point here. Let's just say, for example, that your opponent has the Swords of the Veian Light. And then, you activate Jump Turn. Three turns would go by, and your opponent's Swords of the Veian Light would disappear off the field. Or, here's another example. Do you guys remember the monster Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth? Well, you can summon this card on your sixth turn by tributing Pit and Moth with Cocoon of Evolution. And you know what, that would take a hell of a long time to do that. And yes, I know we've got the new card, Cocoon of Ultra Evolution, that can bring this card out more easier. But again, I'm trying to make a point. I mean, if you activated two jump turns in one go, you could summon the Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth on the same turn you put down Petting Moth. Or, here's another idea. What about Wave Motion Cannon? Yeah, you guys know where this is going. Okay, basically, 
Let's just say, for example, that wave motion cannon was on the field for five of your standby phases, and you sent this card to the graveyard, you can inflict 5,000 damage to your opponent's life points. But, let's just say, for example, that we add jump turn. You activate jump turn while wave motion cannon is on the field. Three turns would go by, and on the turn that you activate this card, you can send it to the graveyard, and you can inflict 3,000 damage to your opponent's life points. And, or, let's go back to the lava monsters again, like Yugi's cards when he was fighting against a Tem. Well, dueling against a Tem. Let's say, for example, that Silent Swordsman was on the field, and you activated Jump Turn. The Silent Swordsman would have gained 500 attack points each turn, and that would mean that the Silent Swordsman has attack points of 2,500, and it has a level of 7, all on one turn. Or, let's just say, for example, that you've got an Armed Dragon level 5 on the field, and you activated Jump Turn. Three turns would have gone by, and you could Special Summon Armed Dragon level 10. And I'm going to give one more example. And there's Zone Eater. A monster attacked by this card will be destroyed during the end phase of the fifth turn after the attack. But again, if you use Jump Turn twice, then that monster that battled with Zone Eater will be destroyed right away. So yeah, you guys have basically got the general idea of what I'm trying to say. We need more cards like Power Clock of Destiny and Jump Turn. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. You're going to say, Oh, but Geek Freak, that would be impractical. Some of these monsters' card effects aren't that good. And also, you can just use a monster effect, a spell card, or a trap card to destroy Swords of Revealing Light. And there are other cards that can help the level monsters level up. If you ask me, I think the effects of Pyro Clock of Destiny and Jump Turn are impractical. Why should I put these cards into my deck if I can find faster ways to bring out my monsters much more faster, like the perfectly ultimate Great Moth or level monsters. Well, here's the thing. Those cards I just mentioned are just examples. And yes, I know there's some cards out there that would be way more efficient to do the jobs faster, like summoning them out faster and destroying a Sword of Revealing Light with a mystical space typhoon or a monster effect. But listen, there are other ways of utilizing this sort of card mechanic. Again, you could use this jump turn effect leveling up your monsters faster, both the regular ones like the Armed Dragons and Yugi's Silent Swordsman, or spell cards like Wave Motion Cannon. And listen, it isn't just these sort of cards out there, but I'm sure there are other cards that makes you wait until your second or third or fourth turn until you can actually obtain that card or activate its effect, like for example, Different Dimension Capsule or the Golden Sarcophagus or Future Fusion. There are plenty of cards out there that could benefit for having jump turns cards and if there's any other card that i'm missing that would work well for cards that you have to wait your turn until you can actually get that card or the effect activates then cards like pyro clock of destiny and jump turn would be perfect for those sort of cards and listen i'm not saying that we could just use pyro clock of destiny or jump turn that makes three turns go by or one turn go by you could have like a, a monster effect that could make two turns go by. Hey, I'm just throwing that out there as an example. Or, here's another idea. Do you guys know the, the Final Countdown card? Where, after 20 turns, you would win the duel? But, let's just say, for example, that you've got the card Jump Turn, you activate it, then that would mean three turns have passed, and the Final Countdown card will be even more closer of you automatically w winning the duel. Or, here's another example. Let's just say, for example, that there was a, a card that can make you go backwards. Now, what am I saying? What am I talking about? Well, I've got this idea of what they could use for a card mechanic. Okay, let's just say, for example, you've got the spell card, Messenger of Peace. As long as this card is face up on the field, no monster cards above the attack of 1,500 cannot attack, and you have to pay 100 life points in order to keep this card up on the field. So, let's just say, for example, that there was like a, a spell card or a trap card that could make the effect of Messenger of Peace rewind. Okay, let's just say, for example, that you've got a spell card called Jump Back Turn, and instead of going forward, it would have to go backwards. But in this case, let's just say, for example, that Messenger of Peace has been on the field for about, I don't know, like uh, three turns, and you've paid 300 life points to keep this thing up on the field. And then you decide to use Jump Back Turn, and it's exactly like Jump Turn, but in this case, it actually goes backwards, three turns. So let's just say, for example, that I've paid 300 life points, just for example, 
and then I decided to use jump back turn on messenger of peace that would mean I wouldn't have lost 300 life points and listen I know what some people are gonna say you're gonna say oh but geek freak what's the point of using a card effect like that on messenger of peace but here's the thing you don't have to just use it on messenger of peace you can use it on any trap or spell or monster effects like here's another example let's just say for example that you've got the trap card mirror wall on your field and in order for you to to continue using this card you have to pay 2000 life points or destroy this card but then you use jump back turn and it would go back three turns and you would have regained all your life points from paying mirror wall so let's just say for example that mirror wall was on the field for about i don't know like uh, three turns you would be down to your last 2000 life points and then you use jump back turn you would have regained all the life points that you paid from using mirror wall and here's the thing you don't have to just target a specific spell card or trap card or monster effects i mean you could but you could do it for the whole turn that affects all the spells traps and monster cards that you have or what your opponent has or is another way of utilizing this card mechanic you could use a card something like jump draw where both of you and your opponent draws two cards because two turns have already passed because of jump draw and just to let you guys know jump draw is just a, a card that i made off i'm just giving out examples here and yes i know what some people are going to say and you're, you're, you're right it would basically be a pot of greed but in this case not only will you draw two cards but your opponent will as well because the card would affect him too or here's another example of utilizing this card mechanic okay let's just say for example you're playing the game and for the last two turns all you and your opponent has done is just draw cards and no adding cards or special summoning cards from your deck both players can't tamper with each other's decks or their own deck all you can do is just draw cards on each of your draw phases so let's just say for example that two turns have passed and then i activated a card called reverse time again this is a card that i've made up now let's just say for example that the only thing that you and your opponent has done is just draw cards from your deck and you haven't tampered with them in any other way and you've either summoned or set it a card or activated a card and this is both you and your opponent and it goes on like this until both players turns have gone past their second turn and then you activate reverse time so what it does is both players puts back the two cards they drew in order on top of their deck and all the cards that's on the field is put back into their owner's hand and any life points that was lost in those two turns is negated and the life points goes back to the number like there was two turns ago so let's just say for example that my life points is 5000 but in the last two turns i lost 2000 life points and thanks to this card i would have regained those life points so yeah basically you've basically turned back the clock and everything goes back two turns so any special summon monsters from your hand or extra deck is put back and any cards that's in the graveyard since those two turns is put back into your hand so basically both players will know what the characters cards are and both players will have another try in going through those turns but in this case the players will know what cards their opponent has and you could play it differently than what you did two turns ago there are quite a few ways of using this sort of card mechanic or do you guys remember when a tem was facing off against yugi and a tem used summoning clock so when yugi used jump turn three turns passed and there were three counters on summoning clock because of the number of turns that passed and if i remember correctly a tem sacrificed the summoning clock to special summon i can't remember which one it was i think it was either obelisk or it was slither and like i said there are so many ways of utilizing this sort of card mechanic if anything this is a rare card mechanic that we barely see either in the show or in real life there is just so many ways of utilizing this sort of card mechanic and so with that said let's move on to the next one and number two is the tomb cards mechanic now it depends on the two monster card like some cards can special summon from the hand some cards can special summon from the deck either trap or monster effect you know stuff like that and most if not all the monster cards are a tuned version of already existing monsters you know the dark magician gemini elf 
Dot Magician Girl, Blue Eyes Toon Dragon, Manga Riaran, and most of the cards heavily rely on Toon World or Toon Kingdom. And that is a field card. And if your monster is a Toon card, if you have Toon World or Toon Kingdom, you can attack your opponent's life points directly. And if it's Toon Kingdom and your opponent is about to destroy your Toon monster, you can send one card from your deck to either, I, th I can't remember what it was, I think it was the um, Banish Pile or it was the, the Graveyard, I forgot. And you know what, I really do love the Toon cards, they are completely indestructible. Okay, not literally indestructible, but they're very hard to kill as long as Toon Kingdom is on the field. And you know what, the Toon cards are actually one of my favourites, and one of few archetypes that I can understand needs support cards. Because, you know, two monsters are in their own little world, if you, if you know what I'm trying to say. It's like the spirit monsters. There are cards that revolve around them because they're completely different monsters altogether. Well, not completely together, but I do understand why Toons need support cards. Because really, even though Blue Eyes Toon Dragon is still a dragon, I mean, you wouldn't put Blue Eyes Toon Dragon in a dragon deck or Toon Summon Skull in a fiend deck. And when it comes to, you know, the actual Blue Eyes White Dragon, you can add the Blue Eyes in a dragon deck and it doesn't have to revolve around of just being a blue eyes deck. It could just be part of a dragon deck. So yeah, the tunes are one of the exceptions when it comes to them having support cards. And you know what, they're loads of fun. I mean, come on, who doesn't love cartoons like Bugs Bunny? I mean, they're powerful, they have good effects, and they can attack your opponent's life points directly, as long as Toon Kingdom is on the field. And there has been a few Toon monsters that's came out in recent years, like the Toon RP Lady, Toon Buster Blader, Toon Blackluster Soldier, and so on and so on. And they have great effects. I mean, really, there's next to no complaints when it comes to Toon Monsters and Toon Cards. Now, I know what some people are gonna say. They're gonna say, Oh, but Geek Freak, if you're praising the Toon Monsters and the Toon Cards, and you're saying all this good stuff about them, then why is it on this list? Well, there is a few things that I do wanna complain about. And number one is, I mean, you wouldn't use Toon Monsters in a competitive game of Yu-Gi-Oh! or in a tournament. Because we all know what their weaknesses are. All the Toon Monsters rely on Toon World or Toon Kingdom. And if you get rid of Toon World and Toon Kingdom, then you take away of what makes the Toons almost invincible. And you know what? That is a shame. Because if I was in a, a competitive game of Yu-Gi-Oh! I would have loved to have played the Toon Monsters in a tournament or in a competitive game. But everybody knows what the weaknesses is for the Toon Cards. So what can we do? To make the Toon Cards more competitive. Well, I do have an idea, and it might make the Toon Cards a little bit broken, but I think it'll make them catch up with today's monsters and spells and traps. Well, my idea is this. Do you guys remember that spell card called the Final Countdown? This was a normal spell card, and when you activate it, it would go straight into the graveyard, but its effect would still be in play. So, in the next 20 turns, you would win the duel. And that's why I think that we need for the Toon Monsters. It would be a spell card, and you could cut something like, uh, I don't know, like, um, Toon Dimension, Toon Universe, or something like that. And after you've activated it, and it's sent to the graveyard, and just like the final countdown card, its effects will still be in play. And of course, even though this is a very powerful card, you would have to pay a price. Like, each turn, you have to send one or two cards to the graveyard in order to keep this effect going, or maybe half your life points each turn. So that way, at the very least, there would be a cost and your opponent wouldn't be able to do anything about it because this new spell card isn't on the field. It would be a continuous spell that was like the final countdown card and it would have all the effects of Toon Kingdom. And again, you would have to pay the price each turn. And also, if you want to attack your opponent's life points directly, you have to after your life points or send five cards to the graveyard. Now, I know what some people are gonna say. They're gonna say, Oh, but Geek Freak, if there was a card like that, and it was like Toon Kingdom, and the effect is forever, it would still make the two monsters invincible. They would be too broken, and there wouldn't be no way to stop them. Well, technically, you're right, but at the same time, you're wrong. Because I have seen monster cards, and spell cards, and trap cards that has destroyed, or banished, or took control of two monsters. Like, for example, the Blue Eyes Twin Burst Dragon. You can remove a monster from play, after a battle. But you know what, maybe there could be like a few more restrictions on the two monsters. Like maybe there can only be three two monsters on the field and there can only be one of each. 
So only one blue eyes toon dragon, only one toon dark magician girl, one Gemini elf, you know, you guys get. I mean, you could add a few more prices to pay to summon another toon monster or to attack. At the very least, this way it'll be more competitive. And number two, the other problem I have with toon cards is, well, the cards aren't really original. I mean, we've got Toon Dark Magician, Toon Dark Magician Girl, Mass Sorcerer, Gemini Elves, Barrel Dragon, Harpy's Lady, etc, 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 etc. There is always a counterpart to well-known monsters. But there are two monsters that we have forgotten and doesn't have a counterpart. There was Dark Rabbit. Yeah, I know it doesn't have the word Toon or it doesn't have any Toon words in its text. But come on, that's a Toon right there. Pegasus had this in his deck. There was Parrot Dragon, and it even says that it's a cartoon from, well, the cartoon world. I mean, yeah, it kind of looks like a cartoon. And there's Bikuri Box. This card was also in Pegasus' deck, and it kind of looks like a toon. And of course, there's Toon Alligator. Now, just to let you guys know, these are the only toons that I remember from Duelist Kingdom. And if there's any other two monsters that I've forgotten that doesn't have a counterpart, please let me know in the comment section below. I mean, these Toon cards don't have any counterparts, and they don't have an effect. And if you ask me, I think they should get an update. You know, give them like a special effect or something. Now, the reason why I'm bringing up these sort of tunes is because, again, these cards don't have a counterpart. Because in the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series, Pegasus had a Toon world that could turn any monster into a Toon, and your opponent couldn't attack it. So yeah, that's pretty cool. A Toon world that can turn any monster into a Toon, and they can't attack that Toon. You know, that's not actually a bad idea. They should make a tomb world that can turn any monster into a tomb. I mean, yeah, I know we've got that glove that you can equip to your opponent's monsters, and then they turn into a tomb. But I like the idea that a tomb world can actually turn any monster into a tomb, and they can't attack it. So, yeah, please turn that into a card. So, yeah, I've gone off track. Let's get back to the tunes that I was talking about. You know, Toon Alligator, Dark Rabbit, you know, etc, etc. And like I said, I think these two monsters should get an update and have special abilities on their own. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the Toon counterparts, and they are just that, counterparts. Toon Dark Magician Girl, Blue Eyes Toon Dragon, Gemini Elves, etc, etc. And they get their power from Toon World or Toon Kingdom. The counterparts get their power from Toon Kingdom and or Toon World. But what if you have two monsters that wasn't a counterpart to an already existing monster, but they were their own original cards with their own effects. Okay, let me go back to the Dark Rabbit for a second. Let's just say that they decided to update this card, and in this text, it says this card is treated as a tune, and it has all the abilities of a Toon Kingdom House. That's right, a toon that has the effect of Toon World, and has the ability to attack your opponent's life points directly. Now listen, this is just an idea, and if you ask me, I think they should try and be creative, and give these original tunes their own special abilities. Like for example, let's just say for example, they decide to create some original tunes that wasn't copied from any monster or doesn't have a counterpart. We got ourselves a cartoon rabbit and a cartoon alligator and a cartoon parrot dragon or something and a cartoon jack in the box. Why don't they create a cartoon duck or a cartoon mouse? Or, oh wait a sec, what about this? What if, now hit me out on this, what if they did different types of tunes You've got tunes from Disney, you've got tunes from Warner Brothers, you know, the Looney Tunes, cartoons from Disney, cartoons from Tex Avery, and each of these tunes would be different, but they would still be tunes. And yes, 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 I know I already said that I didn't like monsters being put into different groups, you know, like the Evolution Sauruses and the Jurassics and the Dino Wrestlers, but there are different styles of cartoons in the real world. Instead of just relying on Toon World or Toon Kingdom, individual Toon Monsters should get the ability of Toon Kingdom and no counterparts but original tunes. And this is what the Toon archetype is missing, its own original tunes. And you know what? They need more Toon spell and trap cards. Like, here's an example. You could have a card called the Magic Pen and you can use it on your opponent's monster and it turns him into a Toon. And then you activate a trap called the Dip. Yeah, I'm taking that idea from Boo Frame Roger Rabbit and you use the Dip on the tomb monster that's on your opponent's side of the field. But yeah, that's just an example. Again, they should just create their own unique type of tunes, and they don't need to rely on Toon Kingdom or Toon World. So yeah, that's all I gotta say. They need to be more original with their tunes and make it more competitive. And so let's move on to number 
one. Now, when it comes to number one, discarding cards, or specifically, your opponent discards cards, either from his hand or from his deck. Now, I really do love this card mechanic because you can say that, oh, you want powerful monsters to go into your deck and you want to put your opponent's life points down to zero or have monster effects or traps or spells that stops your opponents using any traps, spells or monster effects. And you know what? That's all well and good and all, but I've always said that my favorite type of card mechanic was banishing either your cards or your opponent's cards. So yeah, basically banishing cards. But the card mechanic that I'm putting in at number one is the next best thing, and that is your opponent discarding cards from his hand or from his deck. Now, I love this card mechanic because you're not waiting for your opponent to summon a card and you have to deal with those monsters, traps or spells when they get onto the field. But before they can summon anything or activate anything, you could activate a spell, trap or monster effect that could send your opponent's cards from his hand or from his deck to the graveyard. And one of my favorite discard cards is from the anime and it hasn't been officially released is a Shinigre. When this monster is destroyed, when flip face up, your opponent must discard one card from his hand and then you can special summon another Shinigre face down on the field. And you know what? I absolutely love that. Not only did a Shinigre discard a card from your opponent's hand to the graveyard, but you can also special summon another Shinigre and, and place it face down. So now you've got yourself another monster face down defending your life points. And now your opponent has to think to himself, okay, should I just attack that Shinigre and lose another card? Or should I just wait until next turn? A Shinigre is a really good card. Or if you want a real life card that was taken from the show but was made into real life, there is Epoema. And Marek used this against Joey. Whenever it was Joey's turn, he would lose one card from his hand and it would be taken to the graveyard. That was fun. Or there was a, a trap card called Drop Off. So when your opponent is about to draw, you can activate Drop Off and the card he just drew would have to be sent to the graveyard. Or there's the Yowie card. You summon it and your opponent cannot draw on his next turn. Or there's the Trap card, Crush card, Virus. Any monster on the field or in your opponent's hand that has an attack of 1,500 or higher gets sent to the graveyard. So if your opponent has loads of monsters that has a, a 1500 or more, the crush card sends them to the graveyard. Or there's Spirit Reaper. Your opponent must discard a card after battle damages when this card attacks your opponent's life points directly. And you know what? I don't think there's actually enough cards that can make your opponent discard some cards or loads of cards from their hand. I mean, yeah, sure, don't get me wrong. You've got Morphin Jar where both players discards their hand and then they draw five cards and then there's card destruction where both players discard their entire hand and they draw the same number and so on and so on. But the thing is, you want your opponent to lose cards from his hand, not you. I mean, yeah, card destruction and Muffin Jar can help and you're given a, a fresh new hand. But again, you want your opponent to lose cards, not you. And there's not really that many of them. But at the same time, I don't think I want too many cards that makes you stop your opponent from drawing or have them discard a card from their hand or deck because too much of a good thing can ruin some things. And there's no way I want cards that will support this mechanic. I mean, not in the traditional way when we get cards that supports the Dark Magician or the Red Eyes or whatever card supports what. But like example, like a Shinigre, that has a really, really good effect to it where your opponent discards a card from their hand. They should really make that an official card. And considering this card mechanic is really powerful, they should spread this effect out to much more powerful monsters that are hard to summon. But like I said, I want more cards, but at the same time, I don't want as many, if that makes sense. Or, here's an idea. There's a trap card called the Dark Coffin, and you can choose one of its abilities. You can either discard one random card from their hand, or select one monster on their side of the field and destroy it. And that's when Dark Coffin is face down and destroyed and sent to the graveyard. Now, I want more of these uh, discard cards, but at the same time, I don't want a lot if you know what I'm trying to say. And considering that this sort of card mechanic is very powerful, and maybe that's the reason why they didn't make any more, or don't make as many because it's basically dismantling your opponent's hand or deck. Maybe they could do a cost like a magic card that lets you discard a card from your opponent's hand, but you have to send a card from your deck to the graveyard for, in order for that to happen. Or pay 500 life points and discard 
one card from your opponent's hand. And you know what? I'm going to leave it up to their imagination of what they could do for the costs of discarding a card from your opponent's hand. Now, just to let you guys know, this is the part where you're expecting the video is about to end, right? And after one, that would be that. But in my videos, I like to go to number zero. I know it's a bit of a fake out and some people say, okay, it's the top 10 from 10 to 1. But some time ago, I made this gimmick where it was top 10 all the way to zero. And wherever a card is at zero, it stays on the top of the list, no matter what, until it's resolved. Or if it's one of my favorite animes of all time, it would be at zero and it would never ever change. So guess what kids? There's one more after number one. And so let's move on to zero. It's going to be a tiebreaker, you know, two and one. I was originally going to put these two into separate segments, but these two are very similar. And these two things are the toss coin and the dice. And the coin toss and the dice is possibly my favorite type of card mechanic. One of my favorites. Now, when it comes to the coin toss or the dice, it's all based on luck. And just like the tunes, if you're in a tournament or in a competitive game, using coin tosses and rolling the dice and hoping for the results you want. Well, it's a 50-50 split when it comes to the twin costs and depending what you want, you've got a one in six chance with the dice, depending on what you want. And I can see why people don't use dice roll cards and coin toss cards in competitive games. And it's all based on luck. And you know what? That's what I like about them. The game of Yu-Gi-Oh! shouldn't be just limited to strong attacks and outsmarting your opponent and having good strategies. It's all about the look as well. And that's what we do with every turn when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! The look of the draw. But in this case, there's the coin toss or the dice. And I'll give you guys a few examples of my favorite coin toss and dice. And I'll start off with the coin toss. And the first one is the time wizard. Now, I've always said that I've always liked the idea that time wizard can bring out much more stronger monsters because there was dark sage and there was thousand dragon. And time wizard's effect is if you call right, destroy all your opponent's monsters and your opponent's life points equal to half of the attack points of the monsters that you destroyed with Time Wizard. But called wrong, it happens to you. And there was also a spell card called Cup of Ace. You toss a coin and if it's heads, you draw two cards. But if it's tails, your opponent draws two cards. And there's this one trap card that I like and it is called Gamble. If you have two cards or less in your hand and your opponent has six cards in their hand, you activate Gamble and toss a coin. And if you call right, you draw five cards. But if you call wrong, you skip your next turn. There's Barrel Dragon, Fairy Box. There is quite a few toss coins cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! And they do have some decent effects. But the problem is that you have to rely on a success. But there's a, a continuous spell card called Second Coin Toss, where you get to redo your coin toss. So basically, you get another chance. And when it comes to the dice roll, I also have a few favorites for the dice. And my favorite dice related card is summon dice. You roll a six sided dice. If you get a one or a two, you can normal summon one monster. If you get a three or four, you can special summon one monster from your graveyard. But if you get a five or a six, you can special summon one level five or higher monster from your hand. And you know what? I really do love this card. I mean, if all three options are available to you, you're basically the winner, regardless. But the cards have to be in their positions in order for you to have it your way, both ways. Or, here's another famous example. There's Graceful Dice and Skull Dice. Now, in the show, Graceful Dice and Skull Dice are a lot better than their real-world counterparts. Where your monster, if you use Graceful Dice, gains attack points depending on your roll. So say, let's just say for example that I rolled a 6. Your monster would only get 600 attack points. And the same thing can be said for Skull Dice, but in this case, it would lower the attack points of your opponent's monster. But in the anime, it actually doubles your monster's attack. So let's just say, for example, that you've got a monster that had a, an attack of 500. And let's just say, for example, that you rolled a 6. That would mean that your monster attack would increase 6 times. So your monster would get 3,000 attack points. Or is it 3,500? And it's the same with Skull Dice, but in this case, it actually lowers your attack. I swear, they need to update these cards and do them like they was in the anime. And there's this one card called Orgoth the Relentless. If you get a 1 or a 2, it cannot be destroyed by battle or card effect. 
if it's a 3 or 4, draw 2 cards, or if it's a 5 or a 6, Orgoth can attack your opponent's life points directly. So yeah, in its own right, it is a really good card. Or, here's another example. There's the Ritual Monster, Dark Master Zork. If you was to get a, a 1 or a 2, destroy all your opponent's monsters. Or, if it's a 3, 4 or a 5, destroy one monster on your opponent's side of the field. But, if it's a 6, destroy all monsters that's on your side of the field. And you know what, that is kind of a risk. But hey, it's a 1 in a 6 chance. There are plenty of dice related cards, magic, trap, monster effects, doing all sorts of different things. Inflicting damage, summoning a monster, draw two cards, half your life points, attack your opponent's life points directly. There are all sorts of different effects that revolve around dice, like the roulette spider. I highly recommend you guys go and check out what that card does because it is, it is interesting. Now the thing is, even though I find the coin toss and the dice fun, because this is what this game is all about, is having fun. But again, I do understand why people don't want to use coin tosses and dices in a competitive game of Yu-Gi-Oh. These days you want to destroy your opponent's monsters, you want to inflict damage to your opponent's life points. It depends on what you want to do. Deck them out. You know, there's loads of ways of winning against your opponent. And the coins and the dices aren't the efficient way to do that. You know, win against them. So, what can we do to make the coin tosses and the dices relevant again? Well, I do have a few ideas on how they could do this, so I'll start off with idea number one. Idea number one, put the coin or dice onto powerful monster cards, and they can be optional. Like for example, let's just say for example that you have a level 4 monster, and it can be any sort of monster, dinosaur, warrior, spellcaster, etc, etc, and it had attack points of either 1,900 to 2,000. Now the thing is, a level 4 monster with an attack of 2,000 is all great and all, that would be more than enough to add to your deck. But it also add a coin toss or a dice. And the coin toss and the dice will be optional. You can either use it or not use it. Okay, let's just say for example that you summoned a level 4 monster and it was a dragon type and it had an attack of 2,000. And its coin toss ability is, if you guess right, you can destroy one monster on your opponent's side of the field. Or, the dice could be, roll the dice, and depending what number you have, summon as many dragon-type monsters of level 4 or lower to the, your side of the field. And this is just an example. You could have something like this on the rituals, the synchros, the exceeds, the fusions, the rituals, etc, etc. And the coin or dice would be optional. Like, okay, let's just say for example that they decided to update the monster card, Sword Hunter. And to be fair, Sword Hunter's effect isn't really all that good to today's standards. Whenever it destroys a monster card in battle, you can equip that monster to Sword Hunter on your side of the field, and Sword Hunter will gain 200 attack points, which is laughable these days. But let's just say, for example, that Sword Hunter got an update, and its update effect would be when this card destroys your opponent's monsters by battle, equip it to Sword Hunter and it gains 1000 attack points. And if Sword Hunter is about to be destroyed by a magic, trap, or monster effect, you can discard one equipped monster from Sword Hunter to keep Sword Hunter on the field. It would be something like that, but the new Sword Hunter also has another ability, either the coin toss or the dice. Like, let's just say for example that Sword Hunter destroys your opponent's monster. You can toss a coin, and if you call right, you can inflict damage to equal to the monster card's attack points to your opponent's life points. Or, if it's a dice, depending on what number the dice lands on, you can attack as many times depending on the roll you got. So let's just say for example I roll the dice and it was a 4, I could attack my opponent's monsters and life points 4 times. And listen, I'm not saying that this is the effect, I'm just giving this out as an example. The coin toss and the dice could be just an extra effect depending on the effect. And when it comes to the flip coin, I mean if you call right, you can do whatever the effect does. Or if you get it wrong, one of two things will happen. One, it does nothing, or two, something happens to you. Maybe like discard one card, or lose some life points, or destroy one of your own monsters. You know, that sort of stuff. You know, something similar to Tom Wizard. But in my opinion, I think I think we should just keep out the drawbacks. And absolutely nothing happens if you guess wrong. I mean, on monsters, traps, or effects, maybe you could have like a drawback. You know, it, de it depends on the card. So basically, yes, the coin toss and the dice can be just extra effects even though your monster already has effects on it. 
and the majority of the time, nothing happens to you if you guess wrong with the toss coin. And now, let's move on to number two. Now, do you guys remember the final countdown card? Where once you activate and you only have 20 turns until you win the duel and there's nothing your opponent can do to stop it? Well, what if they created something similar to final countdown? But in this case, instead of being a countdown, the spell card effect can be where the results will always be in your favor. Now listen, when a continuous spell card is on the field, it's most likely going to get destroyed by your opponent. But when you have a card like Final Countdown, there's absolutely nothing your opponent can do to stop it. And that's why I'm giving this card an effect. Because no matter what your opponent does, he cannot stop the effect of this made-up card that makes the results go your way. Now, what am I saying? What am I talking about? What, does it, what exactly does it do? Okay, now, when it comes to like you know tossing the coin and rolling the dice, you always want the coin toss to always be right for you. And depending on the dice roll, you're always looking for a specific number depending on the type of card it is. And if you guys have seen the type of dice cards there is, you'll get what I'm saying. But let's just say for example that you've got the trap card Gamble. And if your opponent has six cards in his hand and you've only got two or less, you flip a coin and if you guess right, you can draw until you get five cards. But if you guess wrong, you skip your turn. And if you guess wrong, this is where this new card comes in. Let's just say for example that they created a card or a coin toss or the dice roll gave you the result that you wanted. And you could call it like something like, I don't know, like, uh, like uh, Destiny's on your side or something. And for the rest of the duel, you are given permission to change the outcome of the coin toss or the dice roll. But you can only use it five times throughout the entire duel. And you can't use it on the same card over and over. It has to be used on different cards. Like for example, let's just say for example that you guessed wrong on the coin toss. But this new card would reverse the effect and it would have the results that you wanted. So if I guessed tails and I got wrong, you can activate Gamble's effect anyways and draw until you get five cards. Or here's another example. Let's just say for example that you've got the time wizard on the field. And let's just say for example that you've got the, the wrong call and it was tails. You could activate this new card's effect and have the results in your favor. So instead of getting tails, you would get heads. And when it comes to dice, the same applies. Only this time you get to choose what number you want for the dice. But first, you'll have to throw the dice first, of course. And if you don't like the results, you can just declare what number of the dice that you want. So if you needed a six, you would say, I changed the result of the dice to six. So yeah, I'm basically saying they should create a card where you can manipulate the coin toss and the dice roll. And some people will say, oh, this is a little bit broken, but that is why I said you can only use this effect on one card per duel. So you can only use it on the Time Wizard once, you can use it on Gamble once, you know, you guys guess. So yeah, you're basically manipulating the outcome of the coin toss and the dice. So that's idea number two. Let's move on to number three. And number three is, just like my previous ideas, make them as broken as possible to a point where everyone will say, you know what, screw it, I don't care if this is a dice roll or a coin toss. This card has a really good effect to it. Like maybe you have a spell card that can do Something like flip a coin, and if you guess right, you can draw five cards. Or you can have a trap card that could make the attack of your monster a thousand, depending on the dice roll. So if you roll a six, you would get 6,000 attack points. Or if you roll a dice, and if you were scared of five, you would draw five cards. Or on a coin toss, if you guess right, you can destroy all your opponent's monsters on his side of the field. And if you guess wrong, well, nothing happens to you. So yeah, make them broken to a point where everyone says, you know what, I'm going to put this dice or coin toss card into my deck because it has such a really good effect. So yeah, that's basically my solution. So you can basically have an extra effect or a cheat or make them broken as hell. That's what they could do with the, to the coin toss and the dice. And listen, the game Yu-Gi-Oh! isn't just about strategies and getting the most powerful monster on the field. It's all based on luck as well. And if you think about it, drawing your card is also part of luck as well. So if you ask me, I definitely 100% think they should bring back or make relevant the coin toss and the dice roll. These two are my one of my favorite card mechanics. So I definitely 100% want them to come back and be more relevant again. So, wow, yes, this video has gone on for a long, long time. And I do apologize to everybody who is watching this video. I mean, thank you very much for watching until the end. I really do appreciate it. 
So what do you guys think? Am I right? Am I wrong? What's your favourite car mechanic? Because there are a lot of car mechanics out there. Please let me know in the comments section below and let's get a discussion going. I'm Geek Freak. Peace out. Thank you guys for watching. And if there's a series you want me to check out and review and give my thoughts on it, or if there's a top 10 list you want me to do, or any reactions, or responses, or rants on anything geeky, just leave links and comments in the comment sections below, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Don't forget to like, subscribe, put the bell on, share this video, and leave a comment in the comment sections below. And as for my social medias, I'm literally freaking everywhere! I'm on most video platforms, social medias, forums, and support sites. It's best to pause the video and see where I am. Literally all of this is down in the description box below. So if you want to go and check those out, please do. I'm Geek Freak. Peace out.